This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. For Janine Price, extraordinary events are almost commonplace. Objects hurl themselves across the room and appliances explode. Now researchers are attempting to unravel the mystery of Janine's psychokinetic powers. In 1980, a woman named Etta Smith says she experienced a haunting psychic vision, a vision so powerful and so persistent that it led her directly to the body of a murder victim. Incredibly, Etta's detailed description of the crime was so accurate that she became a suspect herself. Tonight, a special Unsolved Mysteries report, Mysteries of the Psychic Mind. Perhaps the most dramatic mystery of the human mind is a phenomenon known as psychokinesis, the ability to affect objects without so much as a touch. In Pennsylvania, a troubled young man named Don Decker seemed to cause what could only be labeled as rainstorms. Bizarre showers had followed wherever he went. Nine credible witnesses, including police and clergymen, verified Decker's extraordinary experiences. I've been a cop 40 years, and I never heard anything like this here, never. I mean, there's always an explanation when something happens. If you got investigated, you come up with something, this is why it happened. This case here, there is no explanation. And then there's Janine Price of Long Beach, California. Mom, can I have a dollar for lunch? I'll give it to you in the car. By her own account, Janine Price has endured a series of baffling psychic episodes that stretches back to her childhood. But even before objects began to spark and explode around her, Janine claimed she discovered she had the unsettling ability to read minds and predict the future. It all began around the age of 10. Janine says she was consumed by an inexplicable, yet unshakable feeling that she had a sister a sister she had never met. Janine's mother refused to answer her questions. She just ignored me. So then I became even more obsessed with finding out who this person was that I was seeing. Then I went prying into my, par my parents' personal effects one time. There were a lot of pictures of children and uh, other people, but this one picture I came across, when I touched it, I knew it had to be the person. I know who this is. It's my sister, isn't it? I know it. It's, it's my Come sister. Janine's mother was finally forced to admit that Janine did indeed have a half-sister, Judy, from her yes. father's previous marriage. But there was more to Janine's premonition, a terrifying revelation she hardly dared put into words. I then told my mother in a brief, simple form that Mom, I know I'm going to meet her one day, and right after I meet her, she's going to die. I says, Mama, you know, I hate to tell you this, but she says, something's going to happen to, to Judy. She says, I, I know she's going to die, and it's something with her head. Something's, something's, something with blood and in her head. It's like it's going, something's going to burst. Years later, Janine did meet the sister she says she envisioned while still a child. 
In April of 1980, Janine's brother Andrew showed up accompanied by none other than the long lost Judy. Hi, Janine. Judy. How are you? We bonded very, very quickly. Very closely, matter of fact. Come on in. You must be tired. I never told her that I had a feeling that she was going to have a short life after she had known me. It, I just knew it wasn't my place to do so. All the time, there, there were times where I want to say, Judy, no, don't go out the door because you're not going to live. And I want to spend a lot of time with you. Within a year, Judy was admitted to the hospital complaining of severe headaches. Her doctor assured the family that it was nothing more serious than migraines. But Janine recalls it on her first visit. She sensed her childhood premonition would soon be fulfilled. As soon as I touched Judy, the, the, the sense of death and illness was so strong. I think I became too overpowerful, too overbearing with the doctor. I started suggesting that he take x-rays of her, her her skull and her brain and CAT scans. No, I, I noticed that you haven't done any tests on her. Um, well, we've done a couple of tests. I'm glad to report she's going to be all well, right, I think. Well, the test that she really needs is, is she needs a brain scan. Brain scan? Yes. Is there some medical information I don't uh, have? To, do you know the name of a former doctor? No, but um, it's very important. You see, I didn't want to tell you this, but she, she has a brain aneurysm. Uh -huh. Well, I, I don't think this would be a good time to talk to her about that right now. I remember the doctor telling me, he goes, who would know better? You don't even know what you're talking about. You're not the doctor. And I said, no, I'm not. But I know my sister has an aneurysm on her brain. And he just kind of like shrugged me off. You need really to do to this you right this. now. This help. is John, my sister's life over there you're talking about. You I'm, I'm not and as I got more persistent with the doctor, he finally had me escorted with security from the facility. I remember distinctly Janine warning everyone that it, what, what they did for her wasn't enough, that she needed you know something to de de detect. There might be an internal problem. Indeed, there, were, there was, because uh, shortly afterwards, she died. Judith Kelly Price died on August 8, 1980, at the age of 35. Cause of death, an aneurysm of the brain. For Janine, the devastating loss was a most painful episode in a lifetime of frustration. Did a doctor examine you? I feel very alone. It's like a captain without a port. You know you belong somewhere, but where do you find that place to belong? You're not considered to be normal, but you're not abnormal. In September of 1994, Janine sought out Dr. Michael Persinger, one of the world's foremost experts in psychic phenomena. His laboratory at Laurentian University in Canada is at the forefront of efforts to find areas of the brain that produce psychic experiences. When individuals feel that they can see into the future and they have verified experiences of precognition, and you look at those portions of the brain that are most active, what you find is that these individuals' brains are organized in such a way as that they can make connections between events that most people cannot. Dr. Persinger and his staff have tested thousands of individuals, including Janine Price. He has come to believe that psychic episodes result from brief bursts of unusually high levels of electricity within the brain, similar to epileptic seizures. In terms of the activity of Janine's brain, what happens during brief periods of time is that normal functions are enhanced way, way above normal. What precognition is, is that you're seeing things in time outside the normal temporal frame. Well, suppose portions of the brain that mediate space and time are suddenly enhanced in terms of activity. Simply put, Dr. Persinger says the brain is something like a television receiver. The components within a standard TV could be rewired to receive channels that aren't on the dial. During seizure conditions, the brain can be similarly reorganized. The result may be enhanced, possibly psychic capabilities, a brain less constrained by time or space. Now, what's in front of you is a board. Of the 30 or 40 individuals with Janine's profile, many of them also report having the ability to influence objects at a distance. 
the experiences such as light bulbs exploding around them, radios failing, uh, uh, glass breaking. I didn't do this as a child. It developed as I became a, an, uh, an adult. There were several incidents where things actually exploded in my hands. The school called again, can you believe it? What's wrong? I remember one time I was um, holding a coffee pot. Do you want some more coffee? Yeah, sure, thanks. And then I went through many more uh, situations to where we finally had to remove all our glass glasses out of the house because they were, if I touched them and if I got upset, they would break in my hand, they would shatter. In general, it appears that these occurrences are uh, associated with stress and tension. And the theory is that they are a means of, of the mind or the brain to, to release the stress or tension in the individual. Janine says a rash of psychokinetic activities erupted during a particularly stressful time of her life. She was divorced, raising two children and living at her mother's house. Uh, I've seen her um, get real upset, and she had some pictures on the wall one time, and she was terribly upset. She and her, her, her uh, ex-husband had, had had words and so forth, and it was a really a trying situation. I can't talk to you like this, all right? Just, just forget it. Forget it. Goodbye. I, I can't believe he's accusing me. What I'm did he so say? That I'm... Oh, what was that? Oh! oh. She didn't will it to happen. No, mother, uh, it, just, it just happened. It was just, just like a magnetic force just went and just, just pulled itself off the wall and slung it to the other side of the room. I think some of my, my, my son's little friends are kind of afraid of me because we were going out to the car one day in broad daylight. And I was just, I wasn't even angry. I was just charged up. I'll give it to you in the car. <gasps> what was that? The force was so strong that the energy that was coming off my hand actually caused sparks, and the, the keys flew up out of my hand. It's not like any other mom getting mad, because my mom just like gets mad, and she does all kinds of weird stuff. And you don't want to mess with her. So she's not like any other mom. It can be scary at times because um, you know it's going to occur, but you don't always know exactly when. And there's always that fear that you might have someone with you that you don't want hurt. Marie, come here. What? According to family members, one of the most dramatic incidents took place when Janine asked her son to warm up a baby bottle in the microwave. I was so tired. I put it on for one second. My mom got mad. She went over there and touched it and reset it. Janine would later call a factory repairman. He could think of nothing to explain the microwave's sudden destruction. He had told me out of all the years he had been servicing, he said, um, he had never seen anything like that. My daughter was in a hurry one day. She had to, uh, an appointment somewhere. I don't remember exactly what it was. And uh, she had this outfit that she wanted to iron. And the children kept buzzing around her feet and pulling out her skirt and just really upsetting and irritating and aggravating, especially when you're pressed for time and you've got to get someplace. What? What? Um, uh, your brother will help you find a shoe. Help him find his shoe. It's probably over there in the corner. Hey, Ma, did you give him breakfast yet? I'm doing it now, honey. Don't forget the apples that are in the back of the refrigerator for the lunch. And she's just going like this, ironing away, you know? And I'm looking at the iron, and the iron wasn't plugged in. What? What, what, what? I looked at the plug, and I looked at her. I said, honey, would you like me to plug the iron in now? Plugging it in. We do not know. Uh, what type of energy it is, so we invent a term for it, PK, psychokinesis. And that essentially stands for our ignorance. We don't know how it operates. By looking at the brains of people such as Janine, we might get an understanding of the, the form of energy that causes these types of incidents. Yeah. 
scientists are far from explaining the mysterious forces of psychokinesis. Even high-tech tools like magnetic resonance imaging have failed to reveal all the secrets of the human brain. Still, the exploration has helped Janine Price cope with the powerful forces she says once dominated her life. If I could bring at will the energy that I have when I'm frustrated or tired, I've been told that people like myself, that energy has been used and channeled into people with um, illnesses. If I could do that, I would like to do that. In a moment, a stunning clairvoyant vision leads a woman to the body of a murder victim as mysteries of the psychic mind continues. As a young girl, Edda Smith says she had the occasional odd feeling about events yet to happen, but nothing that led her to believe she possessed special abilities. Then at the age of 32, Etta had a single extraordinary psychic experience that changed her life forever. In 1980, Etta Smith was working in an aerospace facility in Burbank, California. On December 17th, a news bulletin triggered an overwhelming sense of dread. Police in Los Angeles report they have located the truck belonging to Melanie Uribe, the young nurse missing since last week. 31-year-old Melanie Uribe had not been seen for days, and investigators feared the worst. Despite a massive search, no one knew what had happened to her. Wednesday. A house-to-house -house search is currently underway. We will keep you posted on... She's not in a house. And now, to Cynthia Gray... It was a, as if someone was talking to me. I, it was a mental thought, but it was as if someone was speaking to me. She's not in a house. After that thought registered, it was as if I saw a picture. I saw a canyon area. I saw a road. I saw it curving. I saw a dirt path. I saw shrubbery, and I saw white through the shrubbery. I could not clearly see what the white was, but it was something distinctively white. And when I thought about that, I thought, well, if what I'm experiencing is the possibility of where this person could be, maybe the white I see is her uniform, knowing that she was a nurse. Detective Ryan. For Etta, the vision was so powerful and so profound, she felt compelled to tell the police, even at the risk of being ridiculed. Excuse me, Detective Ryan. Edda Smith? Yes. That sergeant said you had some information on Melanie Uribe? I couldn't well, just let I think it go. I can help you find her. Because uh, I kept wondering if this person needed help. No. And if their life depended on that help. Well, it would be very wrong of me not to do not something. Explain, but uh, I think I've seen her. You've seen her. I gave her a, a lot of credibility and I was listening to the radio based on the fact that she came in on her own. Uh, you'd found her truck. She indicated her conscience was bothering her, which triggered a response in me that possibly her conscience is bothering because maybe she knows more than she's telling us. But then again, maybe she's, she is, in fact, sincere and real. So let's treat her in that light until we find out otherwise. Based on her psychic vision, Etta pinpointed the area in Los Angeles County where she thought the missing nurse might be found. Lopez Canyon, that's it. Despite Detective Ryan's willingness to listen, Etta worried that the police would not do anything immediately. So she decided to investigate on her own. Accompanied by her daughter, Tina, Etta drove to Lopez Canyon. I just don't understand this. I am so certain. At least when Etta I... stepped out of her car at the top of the canyon, the feeling of dread returned. Maybe I was wrong. Etta was certain that Melanie had not only been there, but that something horrible had happened to her. Oh, no, she's here. 
No, she is definitely here. Let's go down and take a little look. I felt trauma, and I felt scared. And I felt, it was like an energy that was like tingling inside of me. It was uh, sort of like you feel when you get an adrenaline rush. Let's look for something white. On the way back down the canyon, Etta and Tina noticed a set of fresh tire tracks. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What is it? I stopped, and for reasons unknown to me, I wanted to look at these tire marks and I wanted to put my hands in them. I'm starting to feel more trauma and it's starting to build and I'm getting more nervous. Oh my God. What's going on? She was here. She was right here and... and when it got to that point, it was like I was on overload. She was so frightened and... When we got back in the van, the only thing that I could think about is, I want to leave here. I don't want to be here anymore. Further down the canyon, Etta stopped again when Tina noticed something unusual in the brush. I don't see anything. It's right up there, Mom. I walk within six feet of this object. I could not tell what I was looking at. The only thing that I could truly distinguish and know what this was, was she had on white nurse's shoes. Go, go, go! Etta immediately contacted the police. An autopsy later determined that the body was indeed Melanie Uribe. She had been robbed, raped, and beaten to death. Etta Smith's clairvoyant vision had been confirmed. Would you have a seat right here? We just want to ask you a few questions. That evening, Etta was summoned to the police station. At 7 p.m., she was questioned by two detectives she had never seen before. I call you Etta, do you? No, that's fine. Did you know the victim, Melanie Uribe? No. No, I, I never met her. I just, I heard about her on the news. Hmm. You've been up to Lopez Canyon. They wanted me to well, explain no, to them the how the whole thing had unfolded. Mrs. Smith, who's bought it? And, and that seemed very normal to me. Well, my dog but did. after I felt I had finished telling them everything and filled in the blanks, it's like, OK, let's start at the beginning. Tell us this again. Let's just go through the psyche thing one more time, OK? So we go through the story again and again and again. I saw it in my head. Can you really expect us to believe this? This went on for hours. I don't, I don't know what you're going Until to about 10 o'clock that evening. When it comes very obvious to me that now I'm a suspect. You're a liar. Do you think I had something to do with this murder? Mrs. Smith, you know too much. There's too much of a coincidence. I don't have any idea what happened to that woman. The investigating officers, having no other leads or clues, didn't have any other choice at that time but presume she was, in fact, an accessory, either before or after the commission of the crime. Is today Monday? Yes. Etta volunteered to take a polygraph exam. At midnight, five hours after she was first brought in for questioning, Etta underwent the first of two tests. Etta passed both exams. However, the detectives withheld that information. They were still convinced that only someone involved in the crime could know the details Etta had revealed. You failed the polygraph test. I know it. I wasn't sure if it was a bluff or what. I, I was so tired, I, I don't think I really cared anymore. I wanted to get away from them. It was like I was either going to go home or I was going to jail. I'm not sure I cared, but I did get angry. You can't leave me here. At 5 a.m., Etta Smith was formally booked on a charge of murder. I think one of the jailers don't know how to reach me. But I'm telling the truth.
For four days, Etta languished in jail, unaware of certain dramatic events taking place on the outside. Etta. Seems like we made a mistake. We've just arrested two young men who confessed to the murder of Melanie Uribe. In the end, Etta Smith was completely absolved. 15 years later, the two confessed killers are still in prison. In Etta's case, I was quite amazed. And I think a lot of other people were too, but I think a lot of them were reluctant to want to admit it. Had it not been for Etta Smith, I don't think this case would have been solved as rapidly as it was, or possibly not at all. I sometimes wonder what it was that transpired uh, from this innocent person who was murdered, uh, how her death somehow reached out and touched me. Uh, I think it's one of the mysteries in life that many things happen to us throughout our life that are unexplainable. Since a remarkable psychic experience in 1980, Edith Smith has honed her apparent powers. She has assisted police and crime victims in several cases, always providing her services free of charge. In a moment, you will meet a different kind of psychic, a man who claims his paranormal abilities enable him to communicate with the dead. Even for a professional psychic, an unusual occupation in itself, the man you're about to meet is unusual. James Van Prog claims that he can contact the spirits of the dead and convey their detailed messages to those they left behind. It may sound outlandish, but who among us, if given the chance, wouldn't want to communicate with a loved one who has passed away? April 24th, 1994, Burbank, California. A moving collection of photographs celebrates the brief life of a young man named Doug Raskin. Jewish tradition teaches us that when a person dies, it is only the body that dies. I believe that those of you who feel Doug's presence... One week earlier, just shy of his 33rd birthday, the brilliant attorney and accomplished outdoorsman had fallen to his death while climbing Mount Fuji in Japan. Doug's parents, Sue and Don Raskin, did not know how or if they could overcome their grief. It just seemed like nobody could comfort us. And one of my relatives had mentioned James Van Prague, who was a medium. And I kind of picked up on it real fast because I was looking for anything or anybody who could help Don and I at this time. Uh, I couldn't imagine anybody have the ability to be able to see somebody in another place and I was very very skeptical I really didn't feel that that was where I was at at the time I wasn't feeling well and uh, yet I was still hurting and needed to find something the way it works before their meeting with James Van Prague the Raskins gave the psychic no details whatsoever about themselves this recreation is strictly based on transcripts from the actual session did you have a son did you have a son that passed over to the other side? He's here. Yes, of God. Was this some kind of accident? Uh-huh. Because he gives me accident. Was it car or something? No, mountain. And was there head injuries? The Raskins were duly impressed when Van Prog accurately stated that their son had died. Their excitement grew as Van Prog began to talk about other family members who had passed away. Is there a, a, a Nicky or a Mickey? What? Mickey's my father. Uh, uh, and uh, is there a Dottie or a Dorothy? I have an Aunt Dorothy. Did she pass over? Yeah. Who's Ben? Ben's my dad. When he told us all about these events and named all the people that were already gone many, many years, some of them were gone a dozen or so years ago, and uh, their personalities that they had that were so right on, I mean, there's just no way possible. 
Sue and Don were astonished as James recounted specifics of Doug's funeral that only those who had been at the service could have known. Did you have a whole bunch of pictures of him doing different things? He saw that. On one side of the room was a whole bunch of pictures or something. Yes, a collage. A collage of different pictures. Yes, he saw that. And then there was like one main picture, was there? Yes, in a card we made for him with a saying. I just with couldn't words. believe that yeah. James would know all these things. And he specifically addressed the fact that the pictures and the collage that we had put out for that event, for the celebration, were absolutely spectacular. He says, I couldn't have done it better myself. And I really laughed at that because that would be Doug saying that because he loved photography. Uh, basically, I'm a clairsentient and I'm clairvoyant. Uh, clairsentient means clairsensing. I'm an individual who senses feelings and emotions with a spirit people, people that pass to the other side. I'm a sensitive. I'm able to pick up their thoughts and I feel their emotions when they come through. And that's what I relate to people. And he shows me flowers all around. For the Raskins, any residual doubts he might have had were erased when James spoke of another family tragedy that had occurred 33 years earlier. You don't have another son, do you? No. Did you ever lose a baby? Yes. She lived for five days. I had completely forgot about that because I was there only for Doug. And I said, what? I had made him repeat it. He says, I said, your daughter's all grown up today. I said, oh my God, he knows about our daughter. Then I became such a believer. He likes the picture of himself taken at the base of the mountain. Was there a picture of him taken at the base of Mount Fuji, do you know? I don't know. I haven't seen it. The seance brought enormous comfort to Sue and Don, even though Van Praag was not 100% accurate. In fact, the Raskins felt that he completely missed the mark when he talked about photos of Doug on Mount Fuji. They had been told that Doug's camera equipment was never recovered. Two months after we had been to James, I uh, went to the mailbox and I, I saw an envelope from Japan and I came running in to the house and yelled, Doug, there's an envelope here from Japan. Well, open it. As it turned out, Doug's climbing team had gone back to the spot where their friend perished and unearthed his camera from beneath mounds of snow. Inside the package was a photograph James Van Praag had talked about. This is the picture taken at the base of the mountain. Oh, sweetheart. Isn't that beautiful? There were just so many things that occurred that James could not have known about, that um, it, it would be impossible for him to have ever looked up or researched or anything. And that's really what made me a believer in him. Almost everything he said was correct. And it really changed my whole belief there is another side and that James gave it, was able to open it up to us. Does Van Prague have genuine psychic abilities that enable him to communicate with those in the afterlife? Or is he highly perceptive, uncommonly skilled at scattershot guesswork? To find out, we invited 10 people to a seance this past December. None of the participants had ever seen or talked with Van Prog before. They all hoped, however, to make contact with specific loved ones who had passed away. Now keep in mind, the session lasted several hours. We have excerpted some of the more dramatic moments. There's a lady that stands behind you, and she's a very pretty woman. I'm gonna tell you, she's a very pretty woman. Her skin is very soft, i put it that way. And I feel she's, she's a young lady. Um, I gotta tell you... Paula Hartland came to the seance anxious to find out about her mother, who had passed away in 1986 from emphysema. She says something about having some regrets. She had some regrets. And when she comes back, she's very connected to you, okay? It's your mom. It's your mother. Your mother passed over. Mm -hmm. yes. passed over. For six of the ten participants, Ben Prague was able to correctly identify the people he had hoped to contact. For some, he even revealed the cause of death. Because 
Jackie McDonald's daughter had been murdered in her own home, a scenario that Van Prague sketched in detail. Yes, and then she goes back into bed and she thinks, oh, it's just her mind playing games. And she climbs back to bed. And I have to say that she, she falls asleep and she shows me, uh, see, the next thing she shows me is her being attacked. And there was someone on top with a knife. And I see the man, oh boy. He grabs something on the counter. It looks like the knife was in it. It was in a... Block. It was, wasn't it? It was yes. in some kind of a, a, a holder because he pulls it out. Just the big block of knives. That's that it. Yes. Because it's not a drawer. The daughter showed me a visual. It's almost as if it's a very quick movie in front of my head, in my mind. And I see things very fast. It's a little shadowy, but certain details stick out. And he loves birds, by the way. Kathy Hall wanted to find out about a friend who had killed himself. But in this case, as in others, Van Prague drew a blank. Any questions? Sure. Is there, is there anybody, is there anything there from Freddy? Anything there from Freddy? Who's Freddy? Who's that? Freddy's a friend of mine. That passed over. <laughs> joking around. I'm being told Freddy is joking around. Don't know why. Joking around. Did you have trouble breathing at one point? No. How did he pass over? A heart attack? He killed himself. Oh, no, I don't get that. No, I'm not getting it. Sorry. Thank Can't you. get it if it's not there. It's hard to tell sometimes. I admit it's very hard to tell all the time exactly. It's not going to be 100% what's going to, you know, what's black is black and white is white. Was that his ring? During the seance, James Van Prague was unaware that this man, Professor Michael Shermer had been planted in the group by Unsolved Mysteries. And was he bleeding? At the Shermer is a publisher of a magazine that investigates, bleeding. among other things, claims car. about psychic phenomena. Van Prague is a mentalist. A mentalist is a magician doing an act. He's doing what we call cold reading. That is, you meet somebody you've never seen before and you tell them things about them. You start general, you throw things out rapid fire, you watch their facial expressions to see if you're getting hits or misses. When you get a miss, you go right on to the next thing, you don't even blink. When you get a hit, you, you, you follow that till, till the end, until they start saying no again. And then you go to the next thing and you just keep doing that. Did she see different doctors at one period of time? Yes. Thank you. She was bedridden also, wasn't she? Was she in a bed at the... Just briefly. Okay, okay. Was this cancer that your mom... No. No, it wasn't. The reason I ask questions, yes and no questions, is, number one, I am also very human. I have to validate that what I'm getting from the spirit is indeed... I'm on the right level with this individual that I'm speaking with. I want to make sure that the spirit person is com coming through right, that the information is correct. I've got to give you something about a marriage here. Something about a marriage. Was there a separation with the marriage, please? Yes. And that, did your husband pass over? Because uh, your husband's standing next to me, and your husband is here, OK? I get a very strong impact with him when he, when he an impact with a car. Was it a car he was driving, a pickup truck? He, he wasn't driving. He was no. walking, and this one got him? Was he crossing somewhere? Yes, and well, he was, hit him. he was in the street, yes. And someone hit him as he was Laura walking. Laura Wachter Lentz's yeah. husband had indeed been struck by a car and killed. No. For Laura, and Prague went on to make what seemed an astonishing revelation. Yes, you're going to get married again, he says. He, you will get married again. You will, and he's going to help you. He's going to help you get married again. And he says, honey, I'm going to... I was shocked that he would know that because only myself, my fiancé, and my sister and his mother knew. They aren't even in the state. And it wasn't something I was thinking about. Uh, that kind of solidified things for me. Most people who lo lose a spouse eventually do get remarried. And... And Van Prague will always keep it positive. Um, he wants you to know he loves you. Well, of course. What else is he going to say? He wants you to know you'll be remarried. Well, what's he going to say? You'll, you'll never be married again. You'll be miserable, miserable spinster the rest of your life. Uh, this isn't going to happen, right? So these are just general principles of cold reading. And he says... You Stan have Wheel attended the seance with his wife, back. Teresa. And he's sorry they intentionally the sat on opposite sides of the room. You've had major loss, a, um, a traumatic loss. 
got you. Thank you very much. And you're you're connected, aren't you? You two, you two, is this your wife? Yes. Because he's pointing to her, you know, you're his wife. What's your name? Teresa. Teresa. Because I the wheels had come together. to the session hoping to find out about their 19-year-old son, Kevin, who had been innocently gunned down in 1991, allegedly by gang members in a drive-by shooting. Yeah, I want to bring in your, your is it a boy? That has, yes. Because I get a boy. Yes. OK? It's a little son. He says, I'm their son. Yes. OK? Was he killed? Yes. Because he says, I was killed. Yes. Was there a gun involved here, please? Yes. Because he shows me a gun, and he says he was shot. Yes. Um, I don't feel he was shot once. I feel he was shot more than once. OK? Yes. Yes. I feel riddled. I, I really do with bullets. Yes. I do. I feel many bullets in me. And this is what he's giving me here. I'm sorry. It's a gang. It's a gang. Yes. Gang of kids. Gang of kids. And it's Teresa approached me to come in to see James on Prague. I was very skeptical. I really didn't want to come. But then to know that Kevin was killed with a gun and it was multiple shots, it was outside on a street. Uh, he just kept alluding to more and more of the things that he, he had no idea. He would have had no idea. I got a big K, and I don't know why, but I'm being given the K. Is his name with a K, please? Like Kevin yes. or Ken? Kevin. Kevin, thank you. That's what I said, Kevin. He said, I see a big K, and the first name he said was Kevin. I mean, how can, you can't get that off of, you know, just being around this room. It was just amazing. I think he's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. First of all, she had her son's ring on. Big black ring with a K in diamonds on this ring around her necklace, around her neck. Um, now, maybe he saw that, maybe he didn't. I, I don't know. I got a big K, and I don't know why, but I'm being given the K. Well, I was watching her, her eyes, yeah, you, know, wa you know, she starts crying, and her eyes are like saucers, and, and he already knows it's, like it's her son Kevin. that died. So Kevin. two most common names for boys with starting with a K, Ken and Kevin. He says, Ken or Kevin? She says, Kevin, bingo, Kevin. Now she'll run home and tell everybody, he got my son's name, Kevin, right like that, and I didn't tell him. No, he didn't get it. However, Teresa claims that Van Prague couldn't have seen the ring because she had kept it hidden in the bodice of her dress. But perhaps disagreements about details are beside the point. While Van Prague may not have satisfied everyone at the seance, most felt a sense of comfort and healing. Yes, I used to sit there all the time. I do feel a little more at peace. I know that there is another life after this because what James had told me through Kevin and the fact that he sees me, that he hears me talking to him, that it's not all in vain, is what really makes me feel at ease. Sometimes you don't know how you're going to make it from one minute to the next. It's so horribly painful. But now I know that my Debbie can see me and that she can hear me. And I can tell her I love her. There was just quite a few things that were close enough that made you think, well, he's tapping into something. I'm just not quite sure what it is. And when one realizes that there is a life after death, it indeed will change their life and how they live on the earth and how they treat each other. And that is really my most important belief, my mission. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, in 1988, a massive explosion killed six firefighters in Kansas City, Missouri. In the tragic aftermath, investigators determined that arson was the cause, making the six deaths nothing less than cold-blooded murders. Join me next Friday for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.